Hello, welcome back to the Rheumatology Physio podcast. Jack March here, the Rheumatology Physio, and I am really happy to have recorded this episode with Dr. James Noak. I've been trying to get him on my podcast or on some sort of event for ages, and he keeps wiggling away from it, and I finally nailed him down to a Saturday evening, and we recorded for an hour. This is the final part of the five-part series all about axial spondyloarthritis sponsored by Novartis. I'm really grateful to Novartis for allowing me to record these podcasts and supporting me to do so. Um, Do check out further axial spondyloarthritis resources on their ION program portal. There's a link in the show notes. And there is also a feedback link, which is really useful if you could click on that and give us some feedback about the episodes that you have listened to. Hopefully you've listened to the first four. So in this final part of the series, we talk about axial spondyloarthritis in sport and exercise medicine, the role that sport and exercise medicine consultants can take. And also we get some tips from Dr. Noak himself, which are really useful. Please do go follow him on social media. It's definitely worth it. The case studies he goes through, super interesting, usually include imaging um, of some kind or at least something definitely worth learning. There will, of course, be more podcasts to come. We've finished up this Axial Spondyloarthritis series. Do get in touch with me. Let me know what other things you'd like me to record podcasts on in the world of rheumatology. Um, You can find me, of course, on social media. Just type the rheumatology physio into pretty much any social media platform and I do come up there. So give me a follow. Don't forget to subscribe and like the channel. And hopefully you enjoy this podcast with Dr. James Noak. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rheumatology Physio podcast. And I am really delighted. I always say I'm delighted, but I'm extra delighted to be joined by Dr. James Noak. Um, and I say it like that because it annoys him when I call him Dr. Noak, um, which he <laughs> genuinely doesn't enjoy. <laughs> um, and um, Dr. Noak is a sports and exercise medicine consultant. And we're going to talk about axial spondyloarthritis and sports and talk a bit about <laughs> rheumatology and the setting of sports and exercise medicine. So welcome to the podcast, James. Nice to have you on. Thank you very much, Jack. I feel very privileged to be invited, given your podcast alumni. <laughs> well, I've also railroaded you into this a little bit because you um, dropped out on me on a couple of other events, didn't you? So I've I sort of have forced you into this one. So I I and I don't feel guilty about that at all. That's no, very true, and I I definitely deserve this. But although we have um, rescheduled about fourteen fifty, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our diaries have not merged well have they (laughs) um so just first off just um tell us a little bit about or tell the audience a little bit about you and your um sort of day-to-day job at the moment yeah so yeah as you say i'm a consultant in musculoskeletal sport and exercise medicine because i don't just see sport and exercise conditions and cases so i see a whole range of uh, msk problems um i come from quite a actually a very diverse specialty background so initially mainly orthopedics and surgical training and then I switched into sports medicine but then had to go through various acute medicine specialties including rheumatology which I enjoyed a lot I, I much preferred the medical specialties to to my surgical training so I definitely made the right decision and then we went, went into higher sports medicine training after that um, I've been involved in elite sport for 10 plus years but sort of moved out of that to sort of focus on my clinical work um in sport mainly pro pro rugby union working with london irish as their team doctor for 10 years uh but also athletics high level athletics um disability sport as well which i enjoy uh, and now like i say i'm mainly focused on my clinical work so i'm i'm primarily based at pure sports medicine which is a high performance sports medicine uh clinic in central london uh where we have a great mdt setup and also i've got a clinic in spire hartswood uh, which is in mm-hmm. essex uh, so that's, it's quite a simple, simple sort of data, uh, week-to-week routine I've got now, which allows me to spend more time with my family and focus on the other important things in life. <laughs> yeah, pro sport doesn't really allow that so much, does it? <laughs> I've got my weekends back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've got a special interest. I seem to have gravitated or sort of cultivated an interest in hip, groin, gluteal slash buttock pain, for whatever reason. Mm. Um, I enjoy uh, so sort of clinical conundrums and medical masqueraders. Uh, and tendinopathy, which is pretty much the 
the sort of the bread and butter condition for all the sports and exercise medicine doctors. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's me. Perfect. So what, just briefly tell us what, what would be your average patient? Like if you had an average patient, what, 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 who do you tend to see? Yeah. So yes, yeah, so I alluded to, you know, I see a whole range of musculoskeletal problems. Um, but, you know, the, the lion's share probably are sports related. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I would probably see the majority of patients are under 45, uh, which is relevant to our, you know, our chat today. Um, so yes, I see a mix of um, acute and chronic injuries uh, in both the sporting and the sedentary population. Um, but again, because I have a special interest in hip groin buttock pain, I'm seeing a quite you know a, a large number of those patients, and with that comes spinal pain mm. and tendinopathy. Um, so I'm almost seeing a, a, a risky demographic, I suppose, in terms of spondylarthritis because you know uh, it's these patients are are presenting with you know, principally spinal pain, particularly in axial spondyl arthritis, and with insertional tendon problems. So mm. a significant number of patients that I'm seeing are rheumatological conditions masquerading principally as sporting or physical activity related conditions. Yeah, for sure. And I and I yeah. always say to people who are working in usually at secondary care, but in your case, obviously um, it's like ever so slightly different. Um, I suppose you could be described as secondary care, couldn't you? Um, But it's like, if they've got to you, they're less likely to have the simple stuff. The simple stuff goes to the, goes to the, the physios and the GPs filter it quite nicely There's always that higher risk as soon as they're getting to someone like yourself. Is that sort of the case? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. But it's still, you know, I still see myself as a, well, there's certainly cases that many cases are slipping through the net. Mm. Let's put it that way. Um, and, you know, I see patients who have had, you know, for me, suspicious inflammatory type pain and symptoms for, you know, sometimes, you know, five, 10, 15 years. I'm not seeing, you know, patients with relatively acute symptoms necessarily, you know, which is frustrating for me. Um, and, you know, it's like we were discussing earlier, I feel that, an SEM doctor, in a way, is a is a triage point or, or a safety net. You know, we we're seeing this risky demographic, and you know, it's our role to be vigilant and make sure mm. we're screening these patients appropriately as they come through, because they are they are slipping through the net and they're flying under the radar. You know, we know that uh, from you know the NAS uh, the NAS information um, that you know the average d- delay to diagnosis is eight and a half years, which is which is insane. You know, you know that's absolutely crazy for me. Um, and I, you know, I, I, what's, what's also interesting is that I, I would say up until about two years ago, um, I was seeing, I reckon, I, I guess, maximum two or three formally diagnosed spondyl arthritis um, um, cases a year, maybe. Mm. And now, you know, in the last couple of years, I reckon I'm picking up two or three a month, mm. which is a huge jump. Um, and I've sort of reflected on why that might be. It may simply be that I'm being more vigilant. You know, I have an interest in the area. Maybe I'm picking that up. Um, and that actually that makes me think how much have I missed in the past, <laughs> potentially, which makes me a little bit, you know, a little bit worried. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, I've been pondering the, the role of COVID as well in the last couple of years. I mean, the COVID gets blamed for, for a lot of things, but we know that you know, uh, uh, viruses and certainly COVID itself can trigger a reactive arthritis. So mm. it's possible that we could extrapolate that to the onset or the trigger of a the first spondyloarthritic presentation potentially. Yeah, I, I wonder whether the people who were at risk may have developed spondyloarthritis in five, ten years' time, maybe, and then yeah. COVID's triggered it maybe slightly earlier yeah. uh, as a possibility. But it's interesting that you've gone up, you know. 10 that's uh, probably a tenfold increase yeah, yeah. isn't it yeah. um do you think uh that any of the pressures that are being seen by the nhs is is driving any of those patients to your clinic do you think that's, that's, that's a really good point to be fair yeah so yeah people are switching sideways taking a sideway path to me you know i see a lot of patients who are so work in the private sector mm. and fundamentally patients are self-funding to see specialists outside of the NHS domain. So no, you're right, actually, they're coming to me with MSK problems and, and obviously naturally I'm picking up a subset which are inflammatory in nature, there's no doubt about it. But I think as well, maybe, you know, if we think about 
enthesopathy or enthesitis is the is the hallmark of spondylarthritis mm-hmm. yeah and we know that repetitive micro trauma or enthesial stress is what is purported to trigger the onset of the first manifestations of spondylarthritis and maybe it's a change in the physical activity patterns or the sporting patterns through through covid through lockdown maybe people are choosing different types of exercise or more exercising more mm. that's the only trying to think i'm trying to think of there's almost this pr- this perfect storm of factors which are you know you've got maybe maybe covid priming the immune system and then you've got a an environmental or an activity trigger with sport that might be you know, hitting that catalyst Maybe that's what I'm trying to think of. But, but yeah, there's, there's numerous factors that are making me see a lot more. Mm. And, you know, I'm seeing lots of certainly interesting cases, but also in some cases, yeah, I'm frustrated for the patients, <laughs> upset for them as well. Mm. They're, 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 they've, been, they've been dealing with a difficult condition for a long time. Uh, and a lot of them have, you know, mental health con- issues alongside that. Um, so, and actually some, some of them, for some, for some patients, it's almost because you're breaking news when you're making a formal diagnosis or close to a formal diagnosis, you're in some patients breaking bad news, especially those that are super sporty and active and are mm. functionally disabled by their enthesopathy or their spinal pain, their synovitis. Uh, and that's devastating for them. So that's, that's a difficult conversation, but there is, there's another group of patients who it's almost good news because they've been. Yeah. Dealing, relief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They've been dealing with this mills, this sort of medical millstone for, you know, like I say, sometimes you know, 10, 15 years or so. Mm. You, you finally give them a label and a diagnosis and maybe a bit of hope, especially if their disease hasn't been too severe and they haven't got sort of, they haven't got permanence, you know, spinal changes, joint changes. Um, so there's a dichotomy there, certainly. Yeah. Mm. yeah, for sure. And how many of the patients, um, but you might be a bit more difficult for you to call off top of your head but um how many patients you know we see in some of the literature that these patients see on average about six or seven clinicians prior to, to diagnosis um how do, are you seeing patients that are going through those i mean the 15 years or whatever they're probably going to have seen a few people but sort of on average are you seeing them having seen quite a few clinicians first um and for want of a better phrase the d- disease being missed um is, how's that sort of playing out in your clinic yeah, very much so. Um, and I wouldn't say it's any one particular physician or clinician that's doing that. Uh, yes, of course, most of these patients have seen their GPs. Um, and certainly in a time pressured environment like general practice, you know, it's hard to effectively screen rheumatological patients, isn't it? Um, uh, patients who have come through numerous physiotherapists. Again, the condition's been flying under the radar. They've been pushed hard. For example, let's say they've got a, an insertional enthesopathy, a heel pain issue. Mm. They've been pushed hard and been hammering the rehab to no avail, sort of unsurprisingly. Um, and then they might come to me. But I see it uh, from other specialists and consultants as well, orthopedic surgeons, uh, where it's been overlooked and they come for a second opinion. So certainly I've seen a real mixed bag, but they've, mm. yeah, so a lot of them have been on a, quite a significant, difficult journey. Yeah. Them. Are pretty fed up by the time they get to me. Definitely. Are there are there any obvious themes that those clinicians that are in inverted commas missing the diagnoses that they're missing hallmarks? So you know you've already mentioned under the age of forty five the insertional tendon pain. Um, You know we know things about night pain, um, early morning stiffness, um, joint stiffness, for example. Are, Are there any sort of obvious themes that people are missing? Do you think? I think the challenge is. I mean, certainly within the label of inflammatory back pain as well. That's, I think that's a challenge, mm. of pain, because it's easy to call that. And there are, you know, there are numerous definitions out there in various papers, but it's still quite vague, isn't it? Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. You can have a, a, a non-inflammatory, well, non-rheumatological you know, city, you know, uh, occupational related back pain patient who's had pain for 10 years and it can behave, that can, it can give them night pain. They can be stiff and like an old mm. man, woman first thing in the morning. Um, so I think it's hard to pin down the inflammatory label or pin it on, on that patient. And especially because it's, it's a really important part of what the ASAS criteria lays down. It's the, that's the fundamental part for axial spondylarthritis. Mm. So that's, the, that's their diagnosis. You know, having inflammatory, inflammatory back or buttock pain for well, at least three months before the age of 45. 
Um, but I can see how they could be easily missed, to be fair. So I get that. And also things like blood tests. So blood tests are controversial. I don't know what your experience is, but you know, anecdotally, I find that inflammatory markers, CRP, ESR, often aren't raised in my mm. patients. I think maybe in the reactive arthritis patients or the reactive group, maybe they're quite consistently raised, but I couldn't tell you from a textbook whether that, that, that fits or not, but it's not, it's, not, it's not typical. I don't typically see raised inflammatory markers, so it just certainly doesn't rule it out. And I think maybe there's other clinicians are looking at and using that, uh, placing mm. too much weight on that potentially. Same with HLA-B27 as well. We know, that's, we know that's a relatively sensitive test, don't we? Yeah. But it's not particularly specific. Well, it's variably specific across the, the spondyl arthritis subsets. Mm. Um, and we know that patients with spondyl arthritis can, have an, can be HLA-B27 negative. <laughs> so that might throw clinicians. And we know there are, to what, is it 10, 15% of patients are walking around the population, well, 10, 15% of the whole population are walking around HLA positive and will not have the, have the condition as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the reliance on blood tests maybe is something I've seen as well in the past, yeah. Yeah. Um, what about X-ray? Are you, yeah. seeing, are you seeing people rely too much on X-ray as well, do you think? Probably not so much X-ray because we've, I think we've maybe moved more into a, an MRI time, haven't we? Mm. So X-ray still sits on the ASAS criteria, doesn't it? But I, very, I see very few pelvic or SI joint X-rays. So. Oh, good. <laughs> um, but yes, certainly, given that you're, you're only going to see changes late on an X-ray anyway, I can see how that can certainly be missed. Mm. Uh, um, but maybe it's more of an, an issue in terms of access to imaging. So lack of access to MRI in particular, being able to image the spine and the SI joints mm. and maybe the peripheries of some patients. Um, again, so I can, see how, I can see how things can get missed. But when patients are coming around around in circles, it starts to frustrate me a little bit, a little bit more because so I think, well, the penny has to drop at some point. Mm. And I... Uh... It's it, I I swing back and forth it's, and I I find there's so so much variations in there. Like sometimes you you see a patient and they've someone's got stuck on a diagnosis, so it's like proximal hamstring tendinopathy, for example, is a real classic. Oh, they've had this proximal hamstring tendinopathy for like eighteen months or two years. You're like, no, they haven't. Like why are you like, but they, but someone's zeroed it and they made that diagnosis and they're like, right, that's what it is. We need to do these things and we need to fix. And then they refer with that thing and someone looks at it and they go, okay, this is, maybe it is that or whatever. And it gets to yeah, yeah. And then the, the other flip side of it is someone go, let's take proximal hamstring tendinopathy while we're just talking about it. They go, oh, they shouldn't have proximal hamstring tendinopathy for 18 months or two years, but I don't know what it is. And, and I find often it's the other systems that they miss. So it's the skin or it's colitis, it's, osteocolitis or something. Yeah, yeah. How much in, in, in your clinic, how many, how, <laughs> this is a hard question. How many times is it that that makes you go, okay, there it is. Like, cause I, it, my, my experience is often, yeah. I, I was just wondering about you. Yeah. Um, and yes, absolutely. That, that's, really what I should have been talking about in the last conversation. Um, no, you're absolutely right. So, you know, it's just asking those key screen questions, isn't it? Um, and I'll, I'll say to them, psoriasis is a good example. Mm. And I'll say, you know, it's a complete robotic and routine for me, but so do you have psoriasis? Do you have inflammatory bowel disease? Does anyone in your family have those conditions? Um, and <laughs> often they'll say no. They'll say, I haven't got psoriasis. And I'll start examining them. And I'll say, what's that patch? what's that patch on your knee or can I, you know, have a look in your scalp and you'll find patches. And I'll go, oh, right. I know. I we don't know what that is, but um, you know, we thought it was eczema or whatever. So there's, de there's definitely, there's definitely things, easy wins, low hanging fruit, maybe that, that, that can be picked up diagnostically to send you down a complete, you know, change the trajectory of the patient's investigations and management. Mm. No doubt about that. Um, so in the fact, yeah, the family history thing is a big thing. I agree. People just haven't had the time or haven't thought about exploring that a little bit more. Um, uh, and yes, yes, the other things like rashes, eye signs, um, you know, patients will report, you know, I had episodes of red, painful red eye symptoms a couple of years ago, and I was told it was conjunctivitis and it all got better. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's, it, there's so many things to think about. And I think if you've got a template and a routine in clinic, then you're much less likely to, 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 to miss, miss key, key elements mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 
Mm. I always find it interesting from a physio point of view. I remember being taught things like ask about the thyroid, you ask about the heart, you ask about the respiratory system, so on and so forth. Yeah. And then we never then went, oh, what about the inflammatory yes. system? Yeah. Like yeah. it just didn't seem to, it's only, you know, obviously I worked in rheumatology for 10 years. So it's like you say, it's sort of something that I do reflexively and I I probably go too far the other way and think everything's yeah. Yeah. rheumatological. Um, what about, so you, obviously you, you're seeing a, let's, let's, you're seeing a sporty population. Hmm. How many are dealing with these types of um, see, aches and pains and they just are thinking it's a normal part of playing sport a lot? So we know, you know, in, in, in professional sports, for example, even I know that a lot of players are playing injured yeah. um, and they ma- especially through a season, they'll manage things. You know, we've, I've spoken to a lot of colleagues about how they, you know, help people be game ready and those kind of things over and over. How much of there is that, that you know, it's, you, tendon problems are probably a classic, like how many footballers, for example, have got playing with a tendon issue. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? So, you know, how much of that are you seeing? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> probably not a, well, it's, it's something really hard to know. I mean, I'm definitely seeing a subset, subset of mm. patients that, come, that are coming through. I can think of handfuls of cases whereby, you know, let's say, let's pick a rugby player that I can think of that um, has had back, lower back, back, or butter pain and insertion of Achilles pain. And, you know, he's been smashing NSAIDs for, you know, a couple of years. And he's in the twilight of his career. And it's just assumed that he's breaking down. Mm. And, you know, he's struggling in the morning. He's, he's, you know, we're, yeah, we're on, out on a, an away game or on tour. He's the first one down at breakfast because he can't sleep or he's getting up early in the morning. But he's getting through far more NSA. So, so I'm definitely seeing, I can, I can pick cases where that's definitely the case, but I couldn't tell you how many of those are. But mm. so it's a, the, tr- the tricky thing is, isn't it, that some, there's a, a wide spectrum of severity of enthesopathy. So we're using tendons as an example. Uh, and so some, some players can cope with that. Mm-hmm. with little management and it's so who, you know ha, ha, we don't know how many of those we're missing the more severe ones might well trickle through to me and I, like I said I do see those and they're the ones that are not load related necessarily they're the ones that are not responding to offload and rest they're not responding to heavy loading plyometrics etc um, so they're definitely they're definitely out there but it's I can see why some might might be missed mm, um, sure. yeah no, no no it's tricky certainly not easy is it and we wouldn't have an eight and a half year delayed diagnosis if it no, was easy. No, <laughs> and i wouldn't have a job and then yeah, this podcast right. wouldn't exist happen uh, yeah so yeah, it's definitely difficult um the nsaids was going to be my next question yeah. actually the i see a, again a spectrum of patients so who either oh i've taken non-steroidals and they haven't worked and i go oh what have you taken oh i took a couple of ibuprofen last week and it didn't make any difference yeah and then you got the flip side of people who are like they use ibuprofen to get through the day or whatever their flavor of anti-inflammatories is how much of a weight do you put on to that kind of history um because people use anti-inflammatories so it's not unusual is it like but no. is is that something that you factor in quite a lot yeah i do actually um and it's definitely it's i see it part of the the scm role as well mm. alongside imaging and blood tests you know, it's very easy for me to prescribe an anti-inflammatory as a, as a trial. And I tend to use a toracoxib, 60 milligrams, started at an average dose. If a patient, I mean, you're right, there are, a, there's a percentage of true spondylarthritic patients who don't, don't have a profound response, which is just, well, it's a shame for them because they lose a treatment option, don't they, in a way. Mm. But, you know, if a patient comes back to me, and it happens quite a lot, I'll give them the, the toracoxib. And when they first saw me in clinic, they are, tired, peed off, you know, they're depressed, anxious, um, struggling to do their work. I, they come back a week or two weeks later and their whole life has changed. Yeah. I mean, you, you must see this all the time. Mm. Um, and, you know, they've had a good night's sleep. They've woken up 
and bounded out of bed like Superman. And they come in. I know, I know, I know they've had a good response because of how they are before I even talk to them when they get out of the chair in the waiting room. They come down the corridor, they sit down and they're smiling and they've got some colour in, the, in their cheeks. So those patients who have that profound response, obviously that's a huge, that's a huge thing. But also the flip side for them is that they've had, that gives them a diagnosis. So it's, okay, it's great that they've had a fantastic response to NSAIDs, but also, yeah, there's a bit of bad news attached to this as well. But yeah, so I do put a lot of waiting on that. It's an easy thing. That's an easy mm. thing, I think, for a, well, for any clinician, really, but I do that almost routinely in clinic unless there's any contraindications, particularly in enteropathic spondylarthritis, you know, with inflammatory bowel disease. That's a, that's a bit more tricky. Yeah, absolutely. I always remember that so when I worked in the NHS in the rheumatology department, I was doing the spondylarthritis clinic. And so it was my job to see the patients to begin with and then... I wasn't a prescriber, but the rheumatologist would prescribe two weeks or whatever it was. I can't remember. It might've been two weeks of yeah. usually a toracoxib mm -hmm. or, or, or something similar. And at that time, we our follow-ups were about three weeks or four yeah. weeks. And I would I'd get a call after 10 days going, can I have another yes, prescription yeah. <laughs> because it's going to run out? And you're like, okay, well, we're going to diagnose you with spinal arthritis on <laughs> yeah, the yeah, phone yeah. now because Literally, that's, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I'd, I'd be really interested to hear some cases. You, I know you've got plenty of them. Um, one of the things that one of the, the reasons we sort of know each other is is Twitter and you, you yes. post these really fascinating cases. And uh, we sometimes will um, we'll have a bit of a back and forth on text or something. Um, but we're really interested to hear some a, a few cases where that could sort of illustrate especially sporty ones if you've got those um you know some different types um yeah so pick one shoot away let's i mean let's, I, could, I could pick hundreds i reckon yeah <laughs> especially over the last couple of years um I've, I've picked out a couple that i think demonstrate the diversity of spondylarthritis presentation really and the sort of the variability or overlap across across the subgroups mm. and the sort of the challenges and uncertainty that comes with the diagnosis because this you know we had this original phenotypic classification for, for spondyl arthritis and now it's shifted to axial and peripheral more or less but but there's a lot of crossover isn't there mm. it's huge over there's this venn diagram overlap and, that, and that's what i see really I, I don't see them pigeonhole that well at all but I've got a few cases. especially especially if you see a female like yes. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well that's the other thing I, I probably see far less females we're coming in or me making a, a, a formal diagnosis mm. maybe just made me reflect on that but it's certainly much more male i don't know why that is but, but i mean the first case is a guy who um who's in his still, still in his late 20s he so was still pretty young um and he had on well, like a 10-year history of um sort of sports groin injuries really so it started with unilateral groin pain which was diagnosed as um what we'd previously call sportsman's hernia, or in, now inguinal disruption. Had, he was a very keen footballer, very active. He had that surgery and it made him a bit better, um, but didn't have the confidence to return to, to football after that. So he focused on more linear based stuff, gym based activities, easier, easier work, easier stuff. Um, and then sort of was, was managing, but still getting this intermittent hip and groin pain bilaterally at that time. <clears throat> and then Things deteriorated quite quickly this year. Um, so he went abroad to the Far East and had uh, got very severe gastroenteritis, so bacterial gastroenteritis, um, which was formerly microbiologically diagnosed as Campylobacter. And he spent two or three weeks in hospital in Asia. He had uh, colitis on his CT. He uh, was eventually discharged, got better. Then started getting, so it was about three or four weeks after he was discharged, started getting bilateral groin pain again but a slightly different nature of deep-seated mm. definitely with an inflammatory type of pattern to it um also noticing weakness on the right side in his hip flexor <laughs> so pain on active hip flexion lifting his hip up getting dressed putting his trousers on that sort of stuff uh and then slightly a slight period after that starting to get lower back and buttock pain as well um he then, so he came back to the UK, saw an orthopaedic surgeon. They organised an MRI arthrogram of his hips. And when they went to do the arthrogram, which is a, a guided injection mm. from contrast, they noticed he had a, a massive effusion in his right hip. Um, they still, still did the MRI. Um, and, uh, of course they did. <laughs> un yeah, unsurprisingly, he had a cam bump 
and a labral tear, as Fergie mm. does. And so he was getting teed up for surgery and to have a scope and a labral repair and a cam osteotomy. Anyway, quite rightly, he was a bit concerned about that, especially as he had on both sides uh, and came to see me for a second opinion. So when I saw him, you know, he was pretty, really miserable, you know, struggling to walk and get out of the chair. It just didn't fit really. Mm. Um, he had hip joint signs on both sides. So positive failure tests, but also definitely had weakness and pain on resisted hip flexions, completely shut down on the one side. When I did uh, point of care ultrasound, he did have two massive joint effusions. So there was definitely a, a, a sort of a raging synovitis going on uh, in his hip joints. And um, he definitely had SI joint signs as well, examining him. So I, um, so we organized an MRI scan of his pelvis, um, repeat, repeat one of them uh, of his, um, of his SI joints. And so he, he had an, a sacroiliitis, uh, a unilateral sacroiliitis, a sort of florid one, hmm. massive sign of itis in both hips, as we, as we already know. And on the right side with the idea of was had a really significant tenor sign of itis. So that's what was causing secondary to what was going on, I assume, in the, in the hip joints itself. As you know, I've got a bee in my bonnet about hip flexor. Hip flexor being prim blamed primarily for problems. So it's a nice example of that. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> it is never the hip flexor. It is sometimes people. It's sometimes the hip flexor. Yeah. The hip flexor. In this case, uh, it was definitely. In this case, again, it's, <laughs> about it. it's not primarily in the hip flexor. So there's a reactive tenus synovitis mm. in his hip flexor. So um, he, you know, this. So this guy basically has a uh, a reactive arthritis secondary to a campylobacter gastrointestinal infection so campylobacter and shigella are the two most common microbiological triggers for um, a reactive arthritis and in a sexually acquired reactive arthritis chlamydia and gonorrhea i think are the, are the, are the key ones aren't they um, but it's just this guy so we, we typically taught that in a reactive arthritis you have a conjunctivitis arthritis a urethritis if it's a sexually acquired um, well, which this one isn't but he did this guy didn't have any eye signs um, the Joint involvement is usually a mono or oligoarthritis. And in this guy, this just was a bilateral hip joint involvement, which is unusual. Hmm. And hip joint itself is unusual. So primarily, it's, it's, well, it's usually the knee, isn't it? Most commonly affected in reactive arthritis. Hmm. Then ankle, wrist, MTP joints. So hips way down the list there. Um, I think the in reactive arthritis, it's, it's underestimated how much the how much axial involvement you can have as well. So this guy obviously had a sacroiliitis. I think about 10% of reactive arthropathies have, have a sacroiliac involvement. And something like 30 or 40% of patients have an enthesopathy with it as well. So there, there's more to think about and more to talk about, I think, with a reactive arthritis beyond the, the classic triad that we get talk, told about. I think that's a nice, the case I think demonstrates quite nicely how it doesn't pigeonhole into, into your textbook reactive arthritis. And um, But he, he um, I sent him to a, I'm lucky to work in an MDT where I've got consultant rheumatology colleagues. So they saw him. We started on um, uh, prednisolone, oral prednisolone. I did some guided injections, cortisone injections into his hips, which completely switched off his pain. Got rid of that. And started him on etorococcib as well. So he's now mm -hmm. six, he's six, nine months down the line and his symptoms have all sort of come away now. They've all sort of dissolved away. And he's been, he's quite lucky in that sense because 10 to 30% of patients with reactive arthritis become a chronic go into a chronic phase don't they mm. um but i think this, but i think the, the history of his inguinal or his sportsman's hernia his fai his cam is a nice example of how things can sort of mislead you um and you know he could have easily ended up having a scope mm. you know an, an inappropriate scope so and it's, uh, yeah i'm not quite sure how the fact that he had bilateral significant joint effusions still didn't trigger some sort of alarm bell <laughs> at the orthopedic level but uh, that's that's the blinkers that's yeah, the yeah, diagnosis yeah. blinkers yeah. that is yeah. exactly. i've always you know, he's always been told he's got these structures mm. in his hip therefore that's what it is he's following this path and no one's taking a step back and thinking outside the box with yeah. absolutely i mean you yeah it's really interesting to hear that case study because i have uh on my courses i i have some case studies that i take people through and um one that i've sidelined recently for various reasons but is almost that exact same case study uh in a um I think about 30 female um she got she was actually referred into our physiotherapy department via a and e um yeah. because her 
um, back and buttock pain had gotten so severe and and um, she so she and, and she wasn't getting anywhere it turned up happened to it happened to be lunch and I was the only physio there happened to see her and you uh, and she it was reactive arthritis she'd had gastroenteritis right, right. um uh she'd been on holiday somewhere and had it came back almost exactly the same not with, without the history of the um uh the sporting stuff but yeah really yeah uh really interesting i, I just want, I was going to bring up the the triad it's it you see it's with you said conjunctivitis um what is it uh um urethritis yeah that's right isn't it and then the knee so it's can't see like, can't we can't bend it. my yeah, knee yeah, yeah, yeah. um is is <laughs> formally writer's syndrome yeah. was it not allowed to say that anymore i don't know why. no we say it's formally was well don't know why wasn't he um he was a german in the fall oh, that's right yeah so it's not very really working uh, no it's it's um yeah problem <laughs> bit, bit problematic um i think some of his experiments might have been problematic yeah yeah, yeah so you won't give you too much um yeah exactly. <laughs> um but yeah can't can't see can't we can't bend my knee yeah that's that's um, the classic reactive but um i must admit the one the reactives that i've seen mostly are similar to that presentation right. with inflammatory spinal pain or buttock pain i haven't yeah. seen a lot of peripheral stuff um in all honesty yeah. um but i think what's what is really interesting with those is like you say they do do the majority of them do tend to sort of burn themselves off after after yeah. a year or so yeah. so i wonder whether they just never turn up eventually yeah. on the milder end um, yeah. they might never turn up but they get they, they can be a bit of a struggle longer term you know chatting to my rheumatology colleagues then the ones that persist hmm. A real challenge, and they they could even end up on DMARDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Absolutely, yeah. And they they like as you just sort of described, they can have this real blurry mix mm. of like what is it? <laughs> it's a, what do you treat them with? Um, and I'm glad that that's not my job to do. Um, to leave but that to more people. Lumped, reactive arthritis, if you, in terms of the newer by the dichotomy dichotomous classification that we've got now, it's it's nudged into the peripheral. Mm fondal arthritis group and yet as you say you know it has all these actual symptoms overlap as well so just you wonder how useful those those criteria are to at least at least the cold face yeah yeah well absolutely and the research treatment is different isn't it yeah and i i was you know when i when i um um when i teach about spondyloarthritis we split it into axial and peripheral because uh, and the way i do it is i use ankylosing spondylitis yeah. as a proxy for our axial and then i use psoriatic as our proxy for yeah. and it's just a, a useful teaching tool but what i always preface the whole thing with uh, with is it's uh, if you're diagnosed with axial spondyloarthritis it's predominantly axial symptoms and peripheral is predominantly peripheral symptoms it's not only axial um and i think there's a statistic in 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 some papers somewhere where in axial spinal arthritis there's a 98 percent chance you'll get a peripheral uh um enthesitis it's like so all of them do so um it, it you know like you say it, it's a whole whole system problem it's not it's not dichotomized in the real in the real world to, to these things and i think they're useful for research in some ways but um so yeah, yeah. treatment as well. But yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean, that last point makes me think about another case that, that I've, been, I've been looking at. So the um, slightly older guy in his 30s who is actually already diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis slash axial spondylarthritis. And actually his axial symptoms, his lower back and buttock pain have been really well controlled on anti-TNF mm. in five years or so within the NHS. Um, and then in lockdown, he was as many were, ramping up his running, stuff he's not really quite used to, relatively deconditioned. Um, then really struggling with posterior heel pain through that time. And then came out of the lockdown, backed off all his exercise, was still getting significant Achilles insertional pain and plantar heel pain. Um, so he was seeing an external physio who he was trying, trying everything, so offload, boot, that wasn't working. And swung the other way. The pendulum swung quite significantly the other way. He was really having the heavy, heavy loading, plyos, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, that wasn't working for him either. So you know, it was almost getting to the point where it was to the point where it was affecting his activities, activities of daily living, his walking, mm. commuting, dog walking, playing with his kids. I don't think I don't think the penny had quite the, the, the penny had quite dropped with the, the physio that even though he knew he had ankylosing spondylitis that there was this 
peripheral manifestation or that could happen. So yeah, it sort of harks back to what we were just saying, mm. pigeonholing these patients as axial versus peripheral sometimes can be detrimental to the diagnostic process. But so he came to me and, you know, I use a lot of point of care ultrasound um, for evaluating entities and tendons, as you know, because I spend all my time banging on about them on Twitter. Um, but he had a really nice, well, not for him, <laughs> for me, for my Twitter cases, uh, very florid enthesitis. So you get really sort of a, a thick and swollen Achilles insertion, a very significant retrocalcaneal bursitis. So you see the, you know, the classic marked enthesial mm. soft tissue involvement as well. Big, chunky calcific enthesophytes. And you see erosions as well. So it was a nice example of how point of care ultrasound can be really useful in the clinic. Um, and actually, you know, I, I, I'm, the, I'm denied about it, but I actually did a, a guided steroid injection into the retrocalcaneal bursa. Obviously, we have to be mindful about the risk of rupture and tendon injury with that, but that made a huge difference to his pain. Mm. Uh, and with a period of offloading and very gentle graded rehab, we actually got him back to a, a level of gentle jogging, yeah, sort of easy five-a-side football. But I think in some patients, we have to accept we're not, uh, we maybe have to be realistic about what we can achieve with a difficult enthesopathy. Um, and, you know, even with actually re-engaging with his rheumatologist and our rheumatologist, we played around with his, actually added in some um, tradition, well, traditional DMARD, so methotrexate. We had one course of steroid, steroids, had a depot steroid, um, ramped up his toracoxib. We even talked about changing his anti TNF you know, therapies. Mm. Even with all that, we still couldn't get on as, as, as on top of it as we'd like to. Um, so that was frustrating. And I think those those rehab principles sort of transcend axial, well, transcend spondyl arthritis. Generally, I think I, I'm seeing a skewed population where that people are already pretty 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 well conditioned and sporting, cope mm. well. But in the general population, the ones I'm probably not seeing patients are starting from a poor baseline, are poorly conditioned, unfit. So I think any physiotherapist or rehab specialist needs to be aware that they have to be realistic from the outset and set realistic expectations about what you can achieve. And maybe the focus should be maybe maybe more functionally orientated, you know, how do we help you do your job or look after the kids rather than absolute performance and strength measurements. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the other thing we need to be mindful of in the inflammatory patients as well, I spoke to Paul Kerwan about this, yeah. um, is that they all get booted out of tendon studies because they're, they are confounders. So we don't know what happens. So if you put them through a loading program, we don't know, like it's not done. Yeah. Um, and so, so we don't know whether it's good or bad or indifferent or pointless. Like we just said, we have, there is no information. Um, and, and one of the things I, so I've seen clinically trying to load those patients is they have this really sort of, again, to use that word dichotomous response, they're either terrible or they're brilliant. And it, and we're like, you know, if you see a, a normal Achilles tendon problem, you know, you're going to, you're going to put them onto that loading program. It's going to take quite a long time for anything to happen. And they just need to push through it for a bit. These patients, you like, you give it to them, they come back in a week and they're either better or 10 times worse. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, um so it, it would be i mean i don't it, it'd be difficult to to run that study i think but um it would be really fascinating to try and get hold of that information as to exactly what happens to them yeah you know i agree yeah um and i don't think i don't know if there's an appreciation for that in the population so when you know a failure of rehab yeah. You know, we would you would use that as as a justification for a lot of things, really, um, depending on what your sort of belief system is around the free ha the rehab that was given. But a failure of 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 loading programs, like you've just mentioned, so they tried offloading, they tried heavy loading, and if none of it's making any odds, you're at least thinking your diagnosis is wrong. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but in, in these insertional cases, if it's like you know a real heel pain sort of that plantar fasciitis achilles tendon insertion that difficult you know which is which um i think if that's a struggle then i would really be thinking about am i investigating this? yeah especially in this young like you say this young population like i'd be thinking that's, about that it's sort of yeah it's a triage is it out isn't it but you know we're talking about we're talking about rehabilitation and physiotherapy but also against 
taking a step back and looking at it from a, a sports and exercise medicine perspective and our roles that you know we need to be keeping these these patients just generally active mm. and exercising and being physically active don't we because you know we know there's a huge cardiovascular disease and metabolic health burden in, in rheumatology patients and you know they're the ones we really need to be facilitating exercise and physical activity in aren't we um, you, know, it's, you know there's a huge body huge body of evidence that supports the positive role of you know exercise generally in in managing disease activity and disease and symptom severity mm. um, Sevias, 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 the, the, the um swedish um researcher who brought out that that that, that key 2019 paper in bgsm the, the bgsm paper mm. which showed that actually contrary to some some beliefs that exercise might be detrimental to disease to the disease or you know might accelerate disease progression actually we show that it could that high in, high intensity interval training sorry not interval high intensity training cardiovascular exercise and strength-based stuff could have a massive impact well not massive but a significant impact on uh disease uh, the symptoms and uh, disease activity mm, absolutely um, and we've seen we've seen similar things in rheumatoid arthritis and yeah. We are seeing similar things in osteoarthritis as well, so it all makes all makes nice sense and it fits our bias, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, again, those exactly, patients. Exactly, yeah. um, so, it, it's an interesting thing. I just want to pick you up on a little bit. There is is about the the role of uh, this this stepping back, stepping back, seeing everything. You know, not bling blinkered. Um, if you, you let's let's think about if you've got a physio and you, the physio's got the patient and they, they they've been diagnosed you know, with axial spondyl arthritis. Do you think sports and exercise medicine consultants have a real role to do there? Like, you know, let's, because I, I often say, you know, medics are different to physios, obviously, but you, you come at it from a different perspective. And I have often really found that useful in that just this wider appreciation of the health system, as opposed to the musculoskeletal system. How much yeah. of a role do you think, you know, is there there for sports and exercise medicine consultants? I think there's a huge role because we're not just sports medicine doctors, we're sports mm. and exercise medicine doctors. Mm. You know, our role is managing um, medical and long-term you know, chronic conditions with exercise and physical activity. So, yeah, I mean, it's our remit, really. Um, you know, we are, you know, we like I say, well, like I, I come from a diverse specialty background, but, we, you know, we have a holistic training background mm-hmm. and we see all elements of, patient care and patient management from a musculoskeletal perspective. So I, I think it's a key role. Absolutely. Um, we're well uh, placed. Uh, yeah. I think I, I really, you've mentioned anti-inflammatories already, but also the steroids, like mm. I really find that often really useful. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, in just having that, um, that skill set available and yeah. the contraindications, you know, I, I know physios, some physios can prescribe the majority, the majority of us don't, you know, mo- almost I'll, I'll always defer out to a to a doc for for yeah. those kinds of things, but sometimes it's like you know you've got these other diabetes, for example, or you know other healthcare conditions that uh, are health issues that that people have, and it's like, well, what is the impact there? Or thyroid, or yeah. you know, even even hormonal issues like the menopause and stuff like yeah, that. It's yeah. just so useful. Yeah. So like it's, it's like to, if I could have a sports exercise medicine. I do. I have you, but you know, if <laughs> if I could, you know, if I was in the when I was in the NHS, if I yeah. could have someone there and I could just go, what just what about this thing? And you go, yeah. oh, no, don't worry about it. Or yeah, do that. It's just sometimes that's so useful. Um, and, I, and um, and it, we were talking before we sort of came on, like about how you know the difference, not the difference. That's a ridiculous thing to say, but um, you've got orthopedics, you've got sports and exercise medicine, you've got rheumatologists, you've got your skill sets, um, and. You, often I think people defer out to pe- places like orthopedics for, yeah. for interventional medicine, for, let's say. And, and I often wonder how much would it be better and how much keeping it away from orthopedics yeah. in sports and exercise medicine, especially in these rheumatology conditions. There's a huge role for orthopedics in, 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 in rheumatology conditions, but course, um, yeah. you know, earlier on there isn't. Um, and, and I sometimes <laughs> wonder, you know, nice. people it's like just, yourself is a good yeah. option. It's the point, yeah, it's the point at which we intervene in the journey, isn't it? But yes, I think having, and this is the travesty really, I suppose, that we have lots of sport and exercise medicine consultants. We are trained by the NHS. 
a lot of us haven't found our place in the NHS because there's, <laughs> there's supposed to have been, um, have been put, put together. There's some, well, there's, there's lots of innovative SEM doctors who've created these posts, but we haven't had that much help, to be honest. Mm. Definitely, if you integrate someone like myself alongside you and a physiotherapist who has an interest in rheumatological, rheumatology and rehab in a clinic, plus you've got my skill sets of ultrasound and interventional injections and things like that, and the holistic overview, the exercise elements, then clearly that's, that's a huge win for the patient. Mm. Um, but yes, I can see how a lot of patients will, the only option is to refer into orthopedics where maybe, dare I say, there might be a slight lack of rheumatological knowledge or insight. And then you, know, you can see how patients might end up going down an invasive route yeah, to their detriment. Um, frustrating. I'm just lucky that I work in the private sector and I'm, I have a really nice MDT setup like at Pure. So I've got physios who do have a special interest in rheumatology. You know, I can bring them into the consultation. I have plenty of time mm. myself. To, you know, I'm not time poor in my clinic, yeah. really. So, you know, I have to be mindful of that. You know, I, I guess that people struggle with those pressures. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you want to create me a role alongside... <laughs> I don't work in the NHS. It's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you were, that was a general call out to the NHS, wasn't it? James, <laughs> James wants a, wants a post. Mike, Mike Dare, are you out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. The, the last thing I want to do with you is put you on the spot and go, if you had a couple of tips, so general MSK clinicians, couple of tips, you know, for let, keep it to a sort of sporty population mm. to make sure they're going to miss less. What's it called? Getting it right first time, you know, miss less spondyloarthritis patients. I know you're not going to like this question, but, you know, what would your couple of tips be? I suppose be vigilant. Um, you know, have be open-minded about the condition and you know even if you are pressured try and apply a, a screening template like paul cohen screened them mm. like, you know have that up in, you know have that up in your clinic apply it so it doesn't take that long to run through stuff like that you know if you if it's not obvious if it doesn't fit criteria for you know local rheumatological referral safety nets you can do that you know bring them back you know, educate the patients about what these symptoms might look like if they evolve without scaring them, hopefully. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, organize follow up so you can catch them yourself. Mm. Um, you can make recommendations. Uh, you, have to be, I suppose you have to be a bit careful as a non prescriber, but you can make recommendations to patients about you, know, you could trial some ibuprofen, you can buy stuff out of the counter, give that a go. I think as a, if you're a non physician MS clay condition, I think having good relationships with the GP or even secondary care rheumatologists, people you can lean on and, and chat through cases. I think that's important. Uh, and I think, you know, harking back to the exercise chat we had as well, I think it's important to encourage all these patients to, to try and participate in exercise and physical activity, not discourage it. I think that's, mm. that's, I think that's what, quite a key take-home message. You know, it's safe, it's safe for someone with spinal arthritis, proven or not, to exercise, basically. Absolutely. Great. No, there are four perfect tips. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Right. So f to finish off, um, you we've mentioned Twitter a couple of times. You do these really good um threads, they're called, aren't they? Of 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 case studies, which people seem to enjoy. You get some uh, a good few likes, few a couple of tipped over a thousand or so, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the recent history. Yeah, um people's people really like those. So what's your um what's your Twitter handle so people can come and find you? <laughs> Um, it's, it's such a good, such a bad to handle. Um, if I can't remember, it's at Dr. JN underscore sports med. Yeah, that's a really bad Twitter handle. Yeah, okay. I know. Um, but yeah, okay. So we'll we'll pop that in the notes so or people can find in, you. Type in hash i n t h f. It's never yeah. It's, it's, it's never the hip flex. You you must be the only person that uses that yeah. particular abbreviation. <laughs> Or with consent, yeah. If you <laughs> with consent, tick. <laughs> <laughs> There's an in joke for people if uh, listening. Yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're not on Twitter a lot, you're not going to get that. But never mind. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for spending the best part of an hour with me this evening. Um, that was a really interesting conversation. I think people get a lot from that. Um, hopefully, um, understand spinal yeah. arthritis a little bit, sports and exercise medicine role a little bit. Maybe you'll get some referrals. Um, yeah. And uh, and um, yeah, hopefully everybody's found that useful. And yeah, thanks a lot for talking to us. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed that. Thanks, Jack.